Well, good morning, everybody. And uh, it's nice to be back with you after a couple of weeks away. 
so um, welcome uh, to you all. Welcome back to us. And um, we're looking forward just to having a, a time of worship together this morning. So uh, we're going to sing in a minute, but let me just welcome those who are online. I think there are one or two there as well. It's good to have you with us. Uh, so we hope that you are blessed as you join in with us here. It's great to be able to, to share together, isn't it? Um, we're going to begin in a moment with our first, first hymn. But I think we've just got on the slides there a couple of quick notices uh, for your attention. And you'll see, I think the first one is basically a reminder about Food Bank, which is, has just kept going. Over the summer, we do need to keep the Food Bank in our prayers and, uh, you know, obviously where we can support it. On our next slide, you'll see it's just a reminder that this is our final Sunday without groups. Everything starts again from, well, the beginning of September. Um, so uh, we're looking forward to starting a new term, starting programme again, Cameo starting and all the other bits. And in September, we've got a prayer ministry training day on the 24th of September. That's going to be in St. Helens. So there'll be more about that next week. And I'll be uh, asking you if you'd like to come to sign up. And on the 25th of September, we're heading towards a baptism. We've got a big baptism service here. One or two folk being baptised. And uh, we're excited. Do pray for that. Pray for those who are being baptised as well. Um, we're going to now just sing. We're going to worship God. And our first hymn is number 237. It's holy, holy, holy. The words are on the screen, but if you're in the book, it's number 237. So let's stand to sing and proclaim God's praise.
Please be seated. And we remind ourselves why we're here today. We've been singing God's praise. We join together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world, and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may give ourselves to the service of God. And we come back to our holy God. We remember that we have not always been what we would want to be. And so we come before him remembering his promise to receive us as we return to him. Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith, as we say together, Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and ashamed. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May the Father of all mercies cleanse you from your sins and restore you in his image to the praise of and glory of his name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Collect special prayer for today. God of glory, the end of our searching, help us to lay aside all that prevents us from seeking your kingdom and to give all that we have to gain the pearl beyond all price through our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to have our Bible reading now and uh, Dave is going to read to us from uh, from Jeremiah, that prophet from the Old Testament. Reading comes from Jeremiah chapter 2, beginning to read at verse 4, and that's on page 635 of the Old Testament. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, What wrong did your ancestors find in me, that they went far away from me, and went after worthless things, and became worthless themselves? They did not say, Where is the Lord who brought us up from the land of Egypt, who led us through the wilderness, in a land of deserts and pits, in a land of drought and deep darkness, in a land that no one passes through, where no one lives? I brought you into a plentiful land to eat its fruits and all good things. But when you entered, you defiled my land and you made my heritage an abomination. The priest did not say, where is the Lord? Those who handled the law did not know me. The rulers transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied to Baal and went after things that do not profit. Therefore, once more, I accuse you, say the Lord, and I accuse your children's children. Cross to the coast of Cyprus and look. Send to Kedar and examine with care. See if there's ever been such a thing. Has a nation ever changed its gods, even though there are no gods? But my people have changed their glory for something that does not profit. Be appalled. O heavens at this, be shocked, be utterly desolate, says the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of their living water, and dug out cisterns for themselves, cracked cisterns that can hold no water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll come back to that reading in a minute. Uh, quite, quite a powerful reading, wasn't it? Uh, Jeremiah and the Old Testament prophets uh, didn't... Um, didn't pull their punches. But um, I'm going to read to you something that it's an old one, but um, I found it when we were driving back from France, thinking about, I think we did 16 hours on the road altogether in the car. 
So we had a lot of time to kill on Friday. So um, I, I found this, Kate and I were talking, and I found this brilliant letter from a grandma to her grandson. As I say, you may have heard it before. She writes, the other day, I went up to a local Christian bookstore and saw a Honk If You Love Jesus bumper sticker. I was feeling particularly sassy that day because I'd just come from a thrilling choir performance followed by a thunderous prayer meeting. So I bought the sticker and put it on my bumper. Boy, I'm glad that I did. What a, an uplifting experience that followed. I was stopped on the way home at a red light at a busy intersection just lost in thought about the Lord and how good he is. And I didn't notice that the light had changed. It's a good thing that someone else loves Jesus because if he hadn't honked, I'd have never noticed. I found that lots of people loved Jesus. Why, while I was sitting there, the guy behind me started honking like crazy and he leaned out of his window and screamed, for the love of God, go, go, Jesus Christ, go. What an exuberant cheerleader he was for Jesus. Everyone started honking. I just leaned out of my window and started waving and smiling at all these loving people. I even honked my horn a few times to share in the love. There must have been a man from Florida back there because I heard him yelling something about a sunny beach. <laughs> I saw another guy waving in a funny way with only his middle finger stuck up in the air. Sorry about this, by the way. <laughs> then I asked my teenage grandson in the back seat what that meant. He said it was probably a Hawaiian good luck sign or something. Well, I've never met anyone from Hawaii, so I leaned out of the window and gave him the good luck sign back. <laughs> my grandson burst out laughing. Why, even he was enjoying this religious experience. A couple of people were so caught up in the joy of the moment that they got out of their cars and started walking towards me. I bet they wanted to pray or ask what church I attended. But this is when I noticed that the light had changed. So I waved to all my sisters and brothers grinning and drove on through the intersection. I noticed I was the only car that got through the intersection before the light changed again. And I felt kind of sad that I had to leave them all after all the love we had shared. So I slowed the car down, leaned out of the window, and gave them all the Hawaiian good luck sign one last time as I drove away. Praise the Lord for such loving folks. See you soon, Grandma. <laughs> I remember reading that many years ago, and, um, and I find it very hard to, to keep a straight face. Anyway, we were laughing as Kate was driving, I hasten to add. She was fortunately more attentive to the road than the, the grandma in the story. Uh, it's a bit of fun, isn't it? But it's actually also, there's somebody who's on a completely other planet, and yet she still has her eyes on the Lord, in a slightly strange kind of way, admittedly. And that can be a challenge for us today, can't it? How do we keep our eyes on God in a world that is going mad? How do we keep our eyes on God when everything else around us seems to be going down the tubes? How do we keep our eyes on God when we face our own times of trial and trouble? It's hard, isn't it, to stay focused on God because he's a God who we cannot see. Sometimes it's hard to keep our eyes on God just because life is busy. And we may sometimes wonder if our faith is the thing that really can give us everything that we need. Well, if you're feeling a bit like that in any way, shape or form, or any of that resonates with you, then let me tell you you're in good company. The Israelites weren't so sure about their faith and whether God could be really trusted. They thought that as God's people back, I don't know, somewhere around about the 550s BC in Jeremiah's day, the people there had been seeking security and political alliances with other nations. They were seeking to build prosperity, a life for themselves. 
But in all of that, they had forgotten God. They had taken their eyes off God and they had drifted away from him. And in doing so, they had forgotten where they had come from and all that God had given them, all God had done for them. It may have felt okay in the moment, but actually it meant that they had, as verse 11 says in our reading, they had exchanged their glory for something that does not profit. What a travesty. It's a bit like a story, it's a bit like seeing a story of somebody who has everything and then they completely throw it away foolishly. You know, somebody has riches and they go off and they basically live like a tramp. And in our, when we see stories like that, we think, what are they doing? One illustration, one person that came to mind as I was thinking, what would that look like? How could we get that picture of Israel who had exchanged everything that they had from God and had exchanged it for something that was rubbish? What, what could I possibly... I couldn't think of anything with the time I had, but I did think of George Best. Remember George Best? Absolutely amazing, brilliantly talented, gifted footballer. What was his problem? He liked to drink, didn't he? He exchanged his giftedness for alcohol. And he threw it away. He threw his life away. He literally died, sadly. And I know his alcohol, alcoholism ended up not only taking away his talent, but actually ended up taking away his life. What a travesty. And I know George Best, I don't want to undermine him, because I know he had to struggle through that fight in his own way, in his own life. It's just that we know him because he was a public figure. But it does give us a snapshot, in a way, a tiny snapshot of how we can do that with our faith. We can throw it away. We can exchange the glory that God has given us for something that does not profit. We can try and find satisfaction or purpose or security in things that will not last. A busy life a home, a career, a person, an, a bank account, a credit, a doctor, a friend, a reputation, a social media presence, a big piece of cake. <laughs> you know what I mean? There are so many things that we can seek satisfaction or purpose or security in, but none of those things will last. They're all good in their own right, but they will not give us what we need. Only God can do that. But it's hard to put God first, isn't it? It's a challenge, it's a struggle. And it's hard to get everything in its right place. As I said earlier, it's hard to trust a God who we cannot see. So how can we build faith in this God? How can we live it out? How can we live in the power and provision of God? Well, fortunately, Jeremiah gives us some helpful tips. And uh, I guess the section that I've been really reading from is from the beginning of chapter 2 through to about chapter halfway through chapter 3. And in fact, you can carry on reading chapter 3. And as <laughs> There's some wonderful news by midway through chapter 3 that God says, return to me. He's merciful. No matter how far you've gone, no matter how far God's people have rebelled, God says, come to me, for I am a compassionate God. It's amazing, isn't it, that he takes us back time and time again. However, what does Jeremiah say? I'm just going to pull out three, three things that we can take away from Jeremiah to help us to base our lives on God, to trust him, to keep our eyes fixed on him, and to live a life that is based on faith in the power of the Holy Spirit. So, three things. First of all is pray for a fresh hunger. You know, in our passage, twice it says that the people said... They, sorry, the people didn't say, where is the Lord? In other words, they're not even bothered about God. And in fact, the second time it comes, it says the priests did not say, where is the Lord? 
Now, this is the very people of God, the very people that God has pulled out of Egypt and led through the wilderness into the promised land. And they don't even ask, where is God? God isn't even on their minds. They're too busy trying to build prosperity. They're too busy worshipping other things. We need to pray for a fresh hunger as they did. We need to pray for what they got. And that was a prophet who was anointed, who would speak God's word to them. We need to pray for prophets. We need to pray for leaders in our own generation. We need to pray for those who will faithfully unfold God's word and speak out God's message, first of all, to his people. And we need to pray for ourselves for a fresh hunger from God. You know, every move of God in history has always been preceded by prayer, a prayer for God, a seeking of God, a sort of a desperation, a hunger for God. And the most amazing things have happened following that kind of prayer where people have been restored, healed, renewed in God's power, where people in communities have come back to God. Doesn't our world right now need uh, God? Need God more than ever. Interestingly, in our passage today, as we go back to it, did you remember the, the very powerful words from the end of the passage where it says, my people have committed two evils. Number one, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living water. And two, they've dug cisterns for themselves, crack cisterns that can hold no water. That, that's the world we're in now, isn't it? People have tried to, to create for themselves success and life. The nations have tried to create success for themselves and tried to claim power. That's why there's so many wars going on. That's why there's so much unrest. That's why there's so much mental health issues in our, in our world right now. We're surrounded by problems, aren't we? And... Uh, Friends, we could read the news today and hear the cost of living crisis and all that sort of stuff and be very, very worried. We could try and dig ourselves out of this hole. And we shouldn't be inactive. We do need to be careful and wise in the way we act and try and provide good, stable bases for ourselves, our families, our society and so on. But first and foremost, we're to look to God who is the giver of everything. What is it that we say, you know, week in and week out, or we used to say week in and week out, you know, um, uh, you know, all things come from you, O Lord, and of your own have we given you. Everything comes from God. And it all begins with praying for a fresh hunger, that fresh hunger that takes us to God. Number two, remember and trust that God, sorry, remember all that God has done. Um, in verses six and seven, you know, God remind or Jeremiah reminds God through Jeremiah, I should say, reminds the people uh, of, of where they've come from, what he's done for them. He says, uh, what wrong did your ancestors find in me that they went far from me? They didn't say, where is the Lord who brought us up from the land of Egypt, who led us in the wilderness, in a land of deserts and pits, in a land of drought and deep darkness, in a land that no one passes through, where no one lives? I brought you into a plentiful land, he says. Just remember what God has done. It's the people, they should remember all that God has done. He delivered them from slavery. He brought them through the impossible into a promised land. And God promises to do the same for us today, to bring us through into, safely into the promised land, into the kingdom, the place where he rules. And he rules right now over the heavens and the earth. We're to remember 
all that God has done. God rescued his people, and today he has rescued us in Christ. He's given us a, a new hope, a new future. The reality is, is that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, that we once were by nature objects of God's wrath, facing the judgment without hope. Eternal calamity, hell, judgment and fire. The Bible's very clear about those things. And I don't speak of them lightly, nor do I like to. But that was our destiny. You see, God loved us so much, he didn't want that for us. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Friends, we have forgiveness and freedom and we are no longer under condemnation. Doesn't mean to say we don't fight with sin, we do. <laughs> and very, by the way, very often when you're thinking, oh, I'm such a sinner, you know, so, you know, when you're feeling that weight of sin, it's actually that's a sign that God is at work in you. You are redeemed. You know that's not who you are and you're trying to put it to death. Praise God. <sighs> but we're to remember all that God has done for us. We are set free. We are forever. We are walking into heaven. Aren't we a happy and joyful people? I think sometimes we just need to remember where we were, where we came from, and all that God has done for us. You know, it's unbelievable. The gospel is the most amazing thing in all the earth. So if we want to keep our faith fresh, we want to keep our eyes on God. We're to pray for fresh hunger. God meets us in that place by his spirit. He, he rekindles the flame in our hearts. We're to remember all that he has done. And we do that, don't we, as we go back into the word of God, as we retreat into the gospel, as we remember how much God has loved us. We remember our failings, but we remember God's grace, which is greater and then thirdly, we're to turn in humility to God. Acknowledge that only he can give us what we need. It does take humility, isn't it? I hate having... Have you found that, you know, when you, when you do fall into sin, you know, the, the worst time of prayer is following a moment where you know you've just bitten someone's head off, where you've been rude, where you've struggled with the lusts of the flesh, where you've done something you know that if people saw, you'd be ashamed. You think, oh... I find there's a bigger gap between that moment and prayer than there is in almost any other time going to God in prayer. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it's like you just don't want to face it, do you? It takes humility. We have to just humble ourselves. But you see, God loves humility in us. A humble and contrite spirit that God will, God will not despise. That's, I think, why I used to love the sentences at the beginning of morning prayer, a book of common prayer, morning and evening prayer. How many of those sentences were said? Many of you may not know what I'm talking about, but morning and evening prayer, the prayer book always had sentences from Scripture that reminded us that God is loving and merciful and forgiving, and we can trust him entirely. We can humble ourselves before God and he will receive us. We're to turn in humility to God. And he, as we humble ourselves, raises us up. He's the one who gives us that living water. Life in all its fullness. He is the fountain of living water. Jesus said at the feast, didn't he? He said, if anyone thirst let them come to me and as the scripture has said then streams of living water will well up from within them 
into everlasting life. I love being around people who just ooze and overflow with the, the, the peace and the presence of God. In France, we went to a little um, church, and there there was a bunch of nuns. And one of the nuns, she spoke French and no English. And fortunately, between us, we could have a conversation with her. But the most powerful communication she had with us was spirit to spirit. He was a woman who prayed and prayed and prayed. And I could feel it. I thought, oof, wow. So beautiful. So, so beautiful. And as we humble ourselves, we don't know it, but people receive from us. As we humble ourselves, we find ourselves oozing and overflowing with the, the presence of God. And it brings an assurance to us and to others. There's nothing more wonderful than Christians who are humble. Their impact is powerful. And so, friends, let's keep those three things from Jeremiah in our hearts and minds as we think about Jeremiah in the days ahead. We uh, pray for a fresh hunger. Will you do that? Remember all that God has done. Please do that. <laughs> because it's the most wonderful thing he's done for us. And turn in humility to him. So simple, isn't it, really? But all of those things, if we do them, will give an assurance and a strength to us that will see us through everything that we will have to face in this life and give us a, that wonderful sense of anticipation of eternity with our great God forever let's just pray for a moment as we stay on that thought Father, we thank you that you give us all things in Christ. He is our everything. Would you open again the, the wonders of your law to us? Would you open our eyes afresh to see the the magnificence of your gospel given freely to us. Would you come by your spirit and give us a fresh hunger, a fresh work of your spirit in our hearts. Help us to call to mind day after day all that we have in you, all that you've done for us. And Lord, as we Give ourselves to you again today. We ask, Lord, that we may be renewed in hope. And in every element of our lives, Lord, would, you, would we know your great provision, your great provision for us. Lord, don't you know every one of our own needs today. And so we lift them before you. We choose again to give you first place in our hearts and minds. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to, as we continue to just respond, we're going to have two, two songs together, actually. And feel free to stand or, or to remain seated if you prefer. The two songs, if you're in the books, the first one is, is number 872. And the second one is 921. So 872 followed by 921. And if you want to, please do stand if that's fine.
We remain standing as we affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. We say together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated as we continue in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the past week. We pause for a moment to think of occasions where we met someone who made us stop and think about something in a new way. Where we use one of our gifts to help someone. Where we recognised you in the face of a friend or stranger where we saw something beautiful. Thank you for all that we have learnt and seen and done and felt this week, because all the while you were there with us. We pray for those who have been in the news this week, some who seem just like us and others so different, we pray for all, and we pray for those who feel they have no option but to go on strike. We pray for all who are trying to negotiate settlements that will be acceptable to everyone. We pray for all those who have had to make different plans because their exam results were delayed. 
We pray for the families of those whose deaths have been prominent in the headlines, especially the family of Olivia in our own city here in Liverpool. We thank you that you are the God of all comfort. So be a comfort to all who are finding life incredibly hard right now. We think of people who we've met or have crossed our paths this week who are different from us. Maybe they're homeless and living on the street. Maybe they're educated beyond what we could ever dream of. Maybe they're from a different background. Maybe they're different for another reason. Lord, each of these people is known to you and loved by you. Help us to learn to see everyone as you see them. Some schools have already reopened their doors for a new term. Many others soon will. We know that schools bring together a huge variety of people from happy homes, difficult homes, unfamiliar homes, the clever, those who are learning, finding learning hard. We also pray for all those who are afraid to return because they're bullied, asking that you will give them courage to speak out. We pray for those who are the bullies, asking you that you would give them the courage to change their behaviour. Give wisdom to the staff to help schools eradicate any unkind, unloving behaviour. Be with our children. We pray for our schools and pray that they will be places of welcome and refuge for everyone who enters, staff, students and visitors. Lord, we pray for all who have had to flee from their homes and build a new life somewhere else. Those who have left because of climate change, their livelihoods no longer viable because of the climate. We remember all who have had to leave because of war or famine, those who have been trafficked, those who have run away because of fear. Lord, all these people are precious to you, even though they may seem almost hidden from us. We thank you for those who work with them, and help them, and pray that they will gain their sense of self-worth. As we pray for all these people, we pray, Lord, that in your mercy, they will meet you, the living God. And we lift to you, Lord, all those who need a particular touch from you at this time. We pray for those known to us who are sick, those awaiting consultations or operations, those who are grieving, those who are lonely or housebound, we ask you to make yourself known to them through us and through others around them. We pray that our church will be a place of refuge where anyone and everyone feels safe and welcomed, where all who enter may find love and the joy of community that comes from you. But this is not the only place where you are at work and living. We think of our workplaces, our homes, our schools, our communities, all places where you are living and active. When we leave this place of worship, open our eyes and ears to see where you are at work, to follow and serve you there, and to make you known. Our diocesan prayer. Loving Father, by your grace, we long to see more people knowing Jesus and more justice in your world. Help us to live as your disciples in the power of the Spirit and to work to your praise and glory. Amen. Our special leading your church into growth prayer. Shall we say this one together? God of mission, who alone brings growth to your church, send your Holy Spirit to give joy to our worship, vision to our planning, wisdom to our actions, and power to our witness. Help our church to grow in numbers, in spiritual commitment to you, and in service to our local community. 
Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Mighty God, we acknowledge that we have failed to care for this beautiful planet as we should have done. We recognise the seriousness of global warming due to our activity. Now we commit ourselves to live differently, to do whatever we can to break the pattern of destructive consumption and to see the renewal of your glorious creation. We make this prayer in the name of Jesus, your Son, our Lord. Amen. And we bring all our prayers and praises into one. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Well, we come to our final song. Uh, I think we got we got a coffee served after. Is that right? Yes. So, uh, and then refreshments afterwards as well. So, please do stay around uh, to have a cup of tea or coffee. That would be great, and to catch up. But our final song is number seven nine nine. Knowing you, all I want's held dear. Is that right? Yeah, so it's on. Okay, so 799, let's stand to sing.
Let's pray together the words on our screen. Eternal God and Father, you create us by your power and redeem us by your love. Guide and strengthen us by your Spirit that we may give ourselves in love and service to one another and to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen. Amen. Shine.